Richard, great pleasure welcoming you here at ESM. Um, we invited you and I'm happy to see you're here to talk about your book that you published before the pandemic, The Globotics Upheaval. I think it's a great book and I think because it paints a big picture about our future and I think it's also very valuable to look at it against the experience of the pandemic. It deals with the impact of Digitech, as you call it, on our lives, on jobs. And I think we now all went through an experience with the pandemic where this has also taken a different dimension in our life. So that is why I'm super happy to welcome you here and have this lunch conversation with you. But maybe before we take it um, to the book, you have been, you're in the business, if I may so say so, in the academic business now for decades, for quite a long time, since the 1990s. And you're one of the person who has academically tremendously successful, but at the same time, you try to write these books and you write these books in order to also populate the ideas. And I think it's also interesting to learn from you how, why do you do that? Why are you making this effort to more broadly spread the ideas? Hmm. So, uh, first of all, I have to say that there's been a bit of an evolution in my career, that most of my papers had lots of Greek letters in the first decade or two, and then they started uh, getting less. But right from the beginning, I found it very important to engage in policy and found it stimulating and worthwhile. So I, I wrote a paper in 1988 called The Growth Effects of 1992, which you, we used to call the single market. And I found that really interesting that, that people, you know, it passed the market test of relevance. It was written up in The Economist and I talked to, you know, ministers and stuff. And, and I, I found that thrilling. But I think personally, my, my father was also a professor of international trade and he always felt it was very important to engage in public service. He, was, he worked in the Kennedy White House, for instance, preparing the... Kennedy talks when I was in kindergarten. So dad came home from the Kennedy White House and I think I just got imbued that a grown man should be using his intelligence or her, a woman, grown woman, should using his or her intelligence to make the world a better place. It just isn't just crossword puzzles among intellectuals. If, if it has a value, it's because we can make the world a little bit better than it was or reduce the ignorance to a certain mm. extent. And that I found very motivating. And it's, it's why I started Vox. It's why I was an editor on economic policy. And, and so it's been one of the primary things of, of my career, I must say. As you probably knew, Paul Krugman was one of my thesis advisors. And if you think I've gone into policy, I mean, everybody's seen what he's done. Uh, so I must, uh, that may also have been a bit of inspiration as well, that he always felt that it was important to do things that were relevant mm. to the world, not just, uh, um, you know, get published in the top journals. No, well, um, I agree. That's an important point. I mean, that is also why we're doing this, um, this lunch conversation. And just to bring in also the, the audience that we know that is out there for, for a moment. So we will have that conversation. I will now give you also the possibility to more broadly explain what, is, what you have in your book. And then we turn to questions. And when we do that, then also obviously those that are in the audience can post their questions and I will get them here on the screen and I put them to you um, so that we can have a good conversation on that as well and, and, and pick the interest up that is there in the, in the virtual room. Having said that, why don't you just kind of expose your, what, how, how you look at your book, how you look at your book from, the, from today's Could, perspective. Can I grab the books as a little bit of a prop here? So I just wanted to, <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Start off on the right foot. Okay. so. What I want to do, I want to take 12, 15 minutes. And what I want to do in that time is to convince you of three things. The first is that we're at the start of a third great transformation of the economy. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Second, that it's coming faster than most people believe and in ways that few, few expect. And third, it will eventually make the world a better place but the transition might be a little rough. It might cause upheaval. And that's why the second word is upheaval. All right. Now, I have to say that when I wrote, was writing the manuscript back in 2018, 
We'd just seen Trump elected. We'd seen Brexit happen. Uh, I felt more confident about the upheaval. Uh, and we've had some upheaval with COVID, but I'm less 100% sure that we're going to see uh, upheaval and kickback from this, uh, this transformation. Um, but the first two, I think, I I are absolutely true. And the third one, the possibility of upheaval, is serious enough that we have to, policymakers have to start thinking about um, what happens if this disruption happens faster than most people believe. Okay, three transformations. So the first great transformation, uh, which was a famous book by Polanyi on that title, was from the farms to the factory. Now that was essentially driven by, a, in my view, by a technological breakthrough, basically steam power, which allowed humans to transform their environment in ways that weren't possible before. It took a massive amounts of energy that could be concentrated and controlled and eventually allowed people to do things that were absolutely impossible before. And as a consequence, we got the Industrial Revolution. And then a century later after that started, we had globalization opening up with steamships and whatever. So there was a massive move of people and value-added farms from the farms to the factory, given the nature of the technology. The second great transformation, I would say, came in around 1990 with the information and communication technology, in which case it moved us from the factories to the offices. Because the nature of that technology, the ICT, created better substitutes for people who work with their hands. Uh, industrial robots being the classic one. But the same technology created better tools for people who work with their heads, people like you and me. And that opened up a whole new set of value-added possibilities in the service sector, in offices, which drew people out of manufacturing at the same time that the automation reduced the number of people that was needed. It also led to a downgrading of the value of manual work and an upgrading of the value of m mental work in a way that twisted incomes. Now, I just people t tend to think that globalization and automation is always going to lead to more inequality, but it's important to say that in the first transformation from farms to factories, it went the other way around. Because in fact, what steam power did was gave more manpower to people who worked their hands, and it was only an auxiliary in, in, uh, improvement for people who work with their heads with electric lights and ballpoint pens and stuff, but it wasn't, a, wasn't the big thing. The second transformation did this twist. Now, the third great transformation, which I'd like to call the globotics upheaval, if you will, at least for the next five minutes, um, that's a very, very different technology. And that's why I like to call it Digitech. So to me, the big change came around 2016. You can never doubt, date these things exactly. But it's when uh, Fortune and a number of Forbes called it the year of AI. And what they meant by AI is they meant machine learning. And in particular by machine learning, they meant people who got a large structured data set, which meant the question was clear, the outcome was clear, and a lot of po computing power, they estimate large non-statistical models to make guesses. So it, we had, in essence, database pattern recognition instead of just experience-based pattern recognition. Mm. Now, this is creating better substitutes for people who work with their heads, some types of work with their heads. Also is helping with manual work, ma automating a number of things. But the big thing is now experience is in a can. For instance, ju just to give a very, very concrete thing, a very experienced copy editor is, or a very experienced uh, translator is now facing a lot of competition from a machine learning trained uh, model. And so I believe that this transformation, which will be going from the service sector to the sheltered service sector, will have very different income inequality. Uh, we can get into it more, but very different income inequality. Now, the point about this globotics is that this Digitech is affecting the automation of service jobs through things like virtual assistants, robotic process automation, chatbots, uh, more sophisticated AI platforms like Watson and Rachel and uh, Siri, and there's a whole bunch of them, Cortana. Uh, and it's allowing globalization of services at the same time because it's allowing people who sit in one country to work in the offices in another country and thereby creating a new line of arbitrage on service sector jobs. And this is happening 
both the automation and the uh, globalization at the same time. That's why I call it globotics, because it's a mash. I, I'm trying to get everybody to remember that it's happening at the same time, both globalization and robotics. So now let me get on to um, the heart of my remarks, where I want to argue that this time is different, that, that this really is a third transformation. So I'm going to go through five points. First of all, it's in services, not manufacturing. And there's a vast amount of misthinking trying to think through this change, thinking it's going to be like the last 25 years, which was about manufacturing mostly and mining, both the automation and the globalization. The, the important thing about that is about 80% to 90%, especially in the rich countries, work in the service sector, whereas now it's like 8 9% who work in manufacturing. So the, the big effect is going to be this. The other aspect of it is these people are not ready for it. Most of them have never seen globalization, and most of them never seen automation, because computers couldn't really think, and services were non-traded. Now, in the financial sector, like, you, you, there's been quite a lot of globalization in the financial sector, and people who work for big banks know they're competing worldwide in a global market. But in many, many parts uh, of, of the economy, they've never seen it before. The second is it's coming faster than the last wave, because a different physics is involved. So the physics of the last wave of globalization was about moving things across borders. And that's subject to the laws of physics of matter, in which doubling trade flows over two decades is fast. But when it comes to services and this new weightless globalization, we're talking about moving information and data across borders, where doubling the flows every two years is perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about the speed of this transformation, using a mindset that was developed on the last 25 years, you're going to be surprised at how fast it comes because a different physics applies. The second, the third point is that what's really different about Digitech from ICT is that we're programming computers in a different way. Hmm. The programming is different. So before 2016, most computer programs involve code which is a set of logical instructions in which you tell the computer to do this after this after this, and you as the human have to figure out all possibles or else it, or else it crashes. Uh, now, that meant that we could only teach computers to do things where humans actually understood what they were doing while they were doing it mentally. So the, the, uh, the, the, psycholo the psychologist economist Daniel Kahneman calls it thinking fast and thinking slow. Thinking slow is the effortful, conscious thing, like doing arithmetic or algebra. We know how we do that. The thinking fast is like, how do you catch your balance when you're walking down a stair and stumble? Mm -hmm. You have absolutely no idea how you did that. You do it instantly. You can be doing other things at the same time. And since you didn't know how you do it, you could not teach a robot or a computer to do it. Now what we do is we get an enormous data set of things walking down, stumbling or not, catching them or not, and we estimate a big statistical model. So the key point here is that computers now have a set of cognitive skills that they did not have before 2016. And some of those cognitive skills create substitutes for some types of service sector tasks. Not really the whole job, but certain tasks, like natural language processing, machine translation, generation of creative material, pattern recognition in, in large things. There's a whole bunch of things that are every day now on your phone or whatever that weren't possible before, and that will automate many things in the service sector. Now, the, the fourth thing I want to say very quickly is that the problem here is the mismatch in the speed of job displacement mm -hmm. and job creation. So there's a lot of, I think, misguided discussion as to is it going too fast or is it not going too fast? So the thing about this Digitech and machine learning is the business model of the AI geniuses is to replace jobs. They gather a great big data set, for, our, for example, on what Hilton receptionists do when they check in people. They, they estimate a model and they replace half the people with this. And that produces money in real time. And it's because the job exists and they can gather the data that they're replacing it. The AI geniuses are not using it to create new jobs. Mm -hmm because they don't have the data set, for instance. So the nature of the thing is biased towards accelerating job displacement, not job creation. 
And I'm quite sure that we'll get all the jobs we need in the long run, just as we did when we left the farms and we left the factories. But it's a different sp the speed. And it's that mismatch in speed that I'm worried it might lead to the, to the um, uh, upheaval, if you will. And the last point I want to make that's, I think, a systematic misthinking is how this will affect our society. So globalization and automation in the past, the nasty bits of it showed up in a factory closure. It could be on TV, people would protest, there would be a fence around a building or something like that. The whole building empties out or, or a stage empties out, moves off to Mexico or Poland or whatever. That's not how it's gonna happen this time with services. It's one little task at a time, replacement. So it's more like automation and globalization of the service sector will transform every job rather than replace lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. And it'll be very slow, it'll be gradual. It won't seem like a big decision, but just like with these things, over 10 years, it went from being not a very good phone with a short battery life to something that really has transformed our societies and we have to make rules about. But the point is, is nobody decided to do that. Nobody even knew it was happening because it was so incremental and so disaggregated. And in the same way, I think Globotics will transform the service sector. Okay, now let me come back to the, this is all the gloom and doom part, you know, and sort of the middle of the Hollywood. And I want to end in, you know, sort of, where is this going? Now, first of all, the future of work, I believe, is very bright. And we can't know what the jobs are, but we can think about what they will be like. And we should use a process of elimination. And the, the, the buzzword is this, we will do what the Globots can't. So the question is, what can't, artificial intelligence do. And whatever it can't do is what our jobs of the future will be filled with. Because if it can be done by machine learning, it will be cheaper. And it has to be something that's local because if it can be done by a remote human. People, there, there are people, lots of very talented people in the world who think $5 an hour is a middle class living. $10 an hour is upper middle class in a large part of the world. So if it can be done remotely, it probably will. So the jobs that are left in places like Luxembourg are going to be jobs where you actually have to be face to face. You have to be there. So that means the jobs will be more human and more local. And I think it will create a sense of community which will be better going forward. The trouble is we have to get there from here. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end on that sort of happy note. No, th thank you very much also for the happy note at the end. Mm -hmm. and I must say when I, when I read your book, I mean, I, I really love this kind of smartphone revolution idea that you bring up it just and it, it sneaks into our life but it, it it literally changes the life so it's a it's a very important thing and that this is different from closing a factory where you have one big event and everyone notices now um i said at the start and obviously for for both of us and and for all those people out there the pandemic has been a tremendous experience in several respects but also how we see the kind of the virtual world right and um, we have probably been more exposed to this virtual world than many of us ever before. So what, in, in your view, and with your perspective that this is a longer term trend that runs though very, very fast, has this indeed been a, very much an accelerator? Or how do you look at it? Yeah, I think it's uh, mostly, it didn't change that much. It accelerated existing trends. Uh, for one thing, it's only been going on for two years and Trends don't, I mean, trends, you don't even know they've started if it's only two years gone by. But the way I think about COVID is it was like an or, like a, a symphony conductor who got everybody to start playing digital at the same time. But fundamentally, we were, just went to the frontier that existed. All these webinars and things like that, that it, things on the web, uh, they didn't really have to fundamentally invent anything to go to telework. It's just that people had to learn to use the tools. And that would have taken a long time. It would have been delayed. So in essence, it was a forced march to the technological frontier. And we are not going back. Nobody's forgetting how to use Zoom uh, any, anymore. And, but the way I think about it is that we've ran millions of experiments. Some worked, some didn't. Sometimes Zoom was good enough. Sometimes it wasn't. And we're coming back now in person things. And we're discovering, rediscovering the value of face-to-face. But a lot of times we can do things by Zoom that we didn't before. It was, it was very much like email versus phone calls. Mm -hmm. There was that transition where should I call or should I send an email, you know, then, and, or letter versus call, for example. And I, I think we're never going back. So that has accelerated it. 
The other, second is I think people right now are misunderstanding the nature of this uh, off, uh, telemigration. Because what happened in the last two years was the same team, the same people, just started cooperating remotely through telecom. And that's very different than hiring a new person in your team who you've never met. And that, that's gone on too. But nowhere, the vast bulk was the same people just working remotely and, and adding in others. So I, I don't think it'll go super, super fast. But I think already companies are saying, well, we don't need all that office space and they'll, they'll keep people at home. First, it'll be cheaper locations in the same country and same culture, the same language. But as it happened with other uh, things like call centers, it will eventually go off mm. because of the enormous salary differences. There's just you know thousands of percentage differences in salaries. And that, that will eventually, once we get used to remote work, it'll start to move to telemigration. So mm. I, I think it's accelerated, but not fundamentally changed the, um, the course. I mean, you mentioned that in the end, I mean, we are happy to be back. I, I'm happy that you're physically Me sitting too, here, yes, even though we are sitting obviously <laughs> also with uh, some distance Social and both distance. being vaccinated. No, but um, has it also taught us something about the boundaries, right? And, and which humans are, I mean, in the book you say where humans are actually better uh, or what we need, right? I mean, only so far virtual can go. I mean, now everyone, if I look here at our offices, people are happy to come back and interact with each other. You have the coffee corner talk uh, that is, and you figure out is something you needed. So what is it from your perspective that you learn or what can you see? A, here, here is really the boundaries becoming effective. Right. Well, so I, uh, I have, a, have a discussion in the book about the importance of nonverbal communication and face to face. Uh, there's a lot of studies in psychology, evolutionary psychology and stuff. And uh, so as it turns out, we humans build trust through little clue cues that don't come across on video. And mm -hmm. so when it comes to building trust and building teams and spirits and making cooperation, making sacrifices that I expect to be reciprocated, that kind of that kind of stuff is it's very important to be face to face. And as I said, a lot of people are misunderstanding how good Zoom is because they're dealing with people who they already trusted. They had already built up a relationship. So I think that face to face. But on the other, you know, it's it's a classic, you know, innovative things. Uh, it's difficult to discuss things when you're free, free shooting, you're coming together to a thing without face to face because there's so many clues that you pick up. I see what you're saying and you understand me better, but I also see what the other people in the room are looking at what I'm saying about what you're thinking about that and everybody's forming opinions. And so if you're trying to design a project to go through the, that combinatorics one by one is forever. But if you're standing in front of a whiteboard, it kind of happens almost instantly. And also there's, you know, there'll be a, a million focal point equilibriums that are possible and you have to choose one. And usually there's some a, a, a human process in which somebody kind of gets the bell ringer and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, that's right. And then you go on that. So those kinds of things, I think, are what it's about. So, you know, anything to do with physical trust, a lot of, a lot of services have to be delivered uh, face to face. Um, and then, you know, the, the, some, there is stuff with machines. Some people mm -hmm. work with machines where you actually have to be there. And during COVID, we, there was this whole set of workers who still had to go into work. So that's the local things. That's the boundaries, I think. But yeah. So, so what I like to say is, if you are happy about staying at home, your job may be offshore. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's a pretty, fine. <laughs> pretty provocative, <laughs> pretty provocative thing. I mean, um, but let, I mean that brings us a bit a bit um, closer to the to the core idea, right? So, what are the jobs that that may go, and how do we deal with it, and how big is that risk? And, and here a bit of the point is, um, <clears throat> I mean, as an economist, typically when we say, look, there is an efficiency gain to be made, we will be more efficient, we will be actually cheaper, things can be produced cheaper, that per se is a good thing. And it helps because also it makes services available to people who otherwise didn't have it, right? So if I personally, for example, I think that today's tourism or the tourism that we knew before the pandemic wouldn't be possible without IT. I mean, in the early days, you would go to an office, you would kind of, somebody would check you in at the airport or some, these, these kind of things that made also 
the service provision incredibly expensive and it had to become much cheaper for much more people to travel. And nowadays, much more people travel. And mm -hmm. that, that and before COVID, much more people traveled. And that is a very good thing. So what is it then? So if we think of jobs being located somewhere else, some jobs being freed up, why don't we can think at the same time that a lot more possibilities emerge from these efficiency gains. You say, yes, there needs to be sheltered areas and local community services, but isn't it much broader? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, well, first of all, let's focus on tasks rather than jobs. And so the, the jobs will change. You may just need fewer of the people, but, but uh, that, that's, a, that's a detail. So on the value creation, that I think very, very much that, that this is all value creating and it's a good thing. It's one of the reasons I think we'll be richer uh, in the future is because this is all productivity enhancing. I think a reasonably good model is the Snapchat model, that when it went public, I think it was worth, I, I may not remember, something like $17 billion when it went public and it had 300 employees. It might be 70 and, and 2,000, but it was an incredibly small number of people who were using remote workers and uh, software robotics to spin up projects very quickly. And so those 300 people who were all physically co-located and were more generalists and managers, they made this incredible value. And I think to a certain extent, that's, that's what it'll be. Just to be, to be very concrete, I think that this AI will create middle professions between nurses and doctors somebody who has using AI is way more than a nurse, but not quite a doctor. And between draftsmen and architects or road chiefs and engineers or uh, paralegals and, and, uh, and uh, uh, lawyers, I think that, that this AI wisdom in a can will enable average people mm -hmm. to do way more than they did before. And that value creation will, for instance, in medicine, make it much easier for us to provide a great deal of medicine to people who, who now can't afford it, who don't get it. So per personally, I think it is very, very positive. And I'm glad you brought that up. Of course, I, I, I was in the middle of my uh, swing and I focused only on jobs, but it is exactly right to bring that up, that this is a very positive thing for productivity in the sense of quality of life and quality and, and provision of services. And in the end, it'll just be, you know, there's no end of the services we need. Just take taking care of old people, the service of taking care of old people, or health, or preventing diseases, or just any number of services that we all wish we had, and this will enable more of it to happen. Just, but, you know, the transitions to, uh, is, could be difficult. No, I, I also thought it was very interesting what you said. Now, So there will be some job relocation. People will move to different tasks, and then also tasks will change. I, I, it reminds me of a very a, a real-life conversation I had with my daughter when she was considering starting to study law, right? So legal lawyers' tasks will probably change. They will be not doing much of the routine things. That will be what artificial intelligence can do, but they will have different activities. And um, good, good to see, I mean, also good to, to understand it, but so there, still there is the disruption element. And I, I do agree with the fact that Obviously, job list location is always a difficult thing, right? And um, and now it we it it hits, so to speak, the middle class, the white collar workers that need to become more flexible. Um, we haven't seen much of it so far, and that you agree. But so forward looking, is there any kind of expectation how you see this kind of playing out or mm. over the coming years when we are basically moving into this kind of politically? What would you expect politically? Right. Well, so let's just, I mean, let me address the how it will happen. And I think there's a good analogy in, um, in journalism. So uh, when I started in this profession in the 80s, Martin Wolf was a young man uh, uh, and uh, everything was physical. Most of the journalists in London had permanent contracts with newspapers, which allowed them pension benefits, insurance, you know, health, extra health insurance, they could take planned leave, uh, take Christmas or New Year's off, that sort of stuff. Now, most of the journalists in London don't have permanent contracts with newspapers. They're still doing journalism, mm. but in essence, what they've done is, is their jobs have become more precarious. 
So I think to a large extent that this hasn't shown up in terms of open unemployment, but rather precarity in terms of income stream or jobs. And I, I suspect that many of them are earning even more than they were before, but how can they plan to take uh, a long weekend off for their daughter's wedding if uh, they have to always be a beck and call of their, of their clients? Or how can they, what, what, what are you gonna do for maternity leave when all, what you really are is a small enterprise with a, a single employee? So I, th I think the, the problem is that much of this is shifted people off of permanent contracts into the world of gig mm. and it'll increasingly it'll be like that and digital technology i didn't write about this in the book but digital technology has also allowed corporations to destroy the contractual relationship with their employees which was before it was an important way of reducing management and increasing trust so you, you just you just couldn't spend all the time tracking down so you hired them on a contract and then the guy, the woman or man, really liked that contract, so they would they would bail along. Now with the with the digital, you can hire, fire them, follow contract, follow a project at a time, and a lot of people are doing that. And but that's a that's a form of unemployment because people, a lot of people, some people like it, some people don't. But fundamentally, it's more unsure, and that falls on them. And in in some countries, the social welfare system can deal with that. So other ones like portability of pensions and mm -hmm. health insurance things. But other countries, it can't. So I, I think a lot of it is, has shown up that way. So the policy, I mean, deep, deep down, the policy is no different because all we're talking about is people changing jobs just or, or changing nature of the jobs, but just a little bit more frequently. So mm -hmm. all the things that we've learned in the OECD countries about active labor market policies, that's what we need. Uh, and plus in, perhaps income support and uh, you know, assurance that it's all going to be okay uh, so you don't resist change too much. So all, although we just need more of it. So I don't think there's really anything radically new. And it, what's interesting about this compared to the other one, where you move from the farm to the factory, the factory to the office, this is moving from one office job to another. And most of them are still going to be in the cities that most people still live in. So it's actually in some ways less difficult, uh, less traumatic than closing a factory in Janesville, Wisconsin, and that leads to, you know, all the despair that that occurred there people like london journalists they found jobs in london doing more or less the same thing but just in a different way so that i, th I think that that's easier in many ways actually that sounds a little bit kind of more benevolent <laughs> if i may say, say so then i then i understood in your book because there i had actually also thought that it's not that say the journalist or the lawyer who is used to have kind of fixed term contract moves, I mean, may actually lose the job and it may not be so easy to find something in a white collar kind of professional workplace in London or somewhere else, but they may have to move to some lower paid service job somewhere else. Mm. So can too difficult to say how much that dislocation will be or yeah i don't i i couldn't say but i think a, a lot you know the, the, the so there's uh let's say just to take law i i talked to the ceo of a, a major uh, law firm in london he said about 20 percent of their legal work they offshore to low-wage high-skill countries like kenya nigeria south africa that have a similar legal system and basically you want people to read contracts for instance and then there's a lot of automation so, but that then uh, cheap, cheapens the cost, and so therefore leads to some creation. It's the old, the old thing. So it's hard for me to say how much is, but I, I think a lot of it, at least the trends we see so far, is people no longer working for the corporation, the, the job being offshore, but then them rehiring them, mm. doing more or less the same thing. Mm. And universities is going on a lot of that. The tenure track is less important, and they're hiring more or less freelance professors. Or, or advisors to to, to come in uh, without the contract. So, there, that, that I think there will be a lot of that uh, similar things, especially in the human uh, skills like management and law, health, things like that, which are you still need the human contact. I mean, the point that you made before is about that it also obviously hugely depends and and the political upheaval eventually that we may expect with this to come depends on how we deal with it, which also depends on what governments make out of it. And um, so what, what are in your view then the, the key ingredients? You mentioned kind of, so allowing people to change jobs, 
right? So which is kind of an education that you would need. You need to be able to transfer your 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 pensions. Yeah. <laughs> so what are what are other points that you see? I mean, it sounds a bit like a Nordic model, and I think you you mentioned Denmark actually yeah. uh, that that would kind of work that does the trick. Right. right. So so I think a, a lot of what drives uh, populism and the research shows this is that be, the it's not so much that their incomes went down, but they feel threat. People feel threatened. And they worry about that uh, globalization is going to come along and they won't be. But if you're in a society like Denmark where the government says, no matter what happens, you'll get a job, you'll be okay, and people trust the government, then the resistance to change is nowhere near as, as high. And that kind of trust of the government and prov provision that you have a fighting chance to be on both the winner or the losing side of globalization is not all set up in advance and certain group of people win and other people always lose. So that we have to get that kind of trust going. And that's why I think it's easier in some countries where they already trust the government. Uh, and I think in a lot of countries where they don't trust the government, there'll be much more resistance and sort of trying to slow the whole thing down, which is what happened in the last time, you know, with the, from the farm to the factory, there was a lot of anti-progress laws implemented mm. to slow down industrial pra practices and electrification of trains and moving to containers and the ports and things like that. There was many classic examples where interest groups resisted that. Right. Yeah, and you see that now, for instance, with Uber and taxis. In, in cities where the taxis are very politically powerful and organized, they've either excluded or, or um, hindered Uber. In cities where they're not, Uber's just pretty much taken over or other like other Uber-like things. And so I think that idea that you, you also need a government which people trust that to to so that you don't have to resist change. Then then I think I think that's part of it as well. I don't write about that in the book, but the, I think the general trust is something that's a big problem that we need more of. But fundamentally, this is just people changing jobs, and in some ways, it's less traumatic than the last one. So you know, if governments just simply assure people that they'll get new jobs and they'll be supported and the rent will be paid and their pensions will continue, and they'll be able to send their kids to you know to to school. Uh, then I think things will be a lot easier, but but it, it may have to scale up the uh, spending on that. I think still in also in Denmark, it works. They give you reassurance when you lose it, and they make sure you can retrain. But they also give you strong incentives to take another job, yeah. <laughs> and not and also to the employers to get actually get you on the job. I, I think that's important. But you mentioned the other thing, the other element, which is kind of the the Uber and, and taxi analogy. And if I'm of course a taxi driver. And I had to buy a license for a hundred thousand euro, which some of those licenses actually are worth it. And I had to do a special test and training. I also understand that there is an intruder who comes in at a much cheaper price, and I don't want that, right? And and then I can exercise some political influence. But I mean, there is also why I thought that makes becomes much more difficult in the global world that you are describing, because he, you may exercise some pressure on your local council, but if the other work is somewhere in India or somewhere else, what do you do, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's one of the reasons that I talked about upheavals, because we'll actually see these people. They'll be working with us, but they'll be in countries where cost of living is much lower, taxation is totally different, et cetera. And uh, it's, it's not clear what to do about that. I mean, there's a, a couple of clear things which I think could be done and some, some people are talking about doing them. First of all, it's not clear that all these freelancers pay taxes anywhere and uh, that there's maybe no mechanisms to reveal the where the income's being made. But in principle, they could because they all have bank accounts and the freelance platforms know where those bank accounts are and so it could do that. And the other is labor standards, um, fundamental labor standards like underage work, for example, for ta tagging photos. I think it's we'll, we'll need to have some regulations for that. But deep down, globalization is about arbitrage. And I, I did a paper of, on telemigration in Colombia for the, with the big project the Colombian government was doing. And we found that for the telemigratable jobs, the teleworkable jobs, the average price difference between Colombians and Americans was 17 times, 1,700%. Mm -hmm. And that kind of arbitrage exists because of the enormous income differences in the world, which aren't going away. So this idea that this will open up pipelines for arbitrage on, on wages 
That's why, that's why I believe that there may eventually be an upheaval. Um, I mean, again, taking it to the, to the pandemic experience uh, with this arbitrage existing. And so there, there are two consequences, right? So when you say like there will be more specialized jobs and there will be those people who govern the, the computers and the robots, and those are then the wealthy ones because their job is safe and they actually have more power in, in, in running the economy. So that is, could be even people here. And then there are the other people somewhere else uh, on the world that the remote intelligence, as you call them, that actually undermine the power. So it, it's a great deal also of question, how can you tax and maybe redistribute that difference in income, right? So that, that emerges from it and how you can do that at a global scale. And when I just like look at the current environment and I see that there was a tax agreement on corporate taxation globally, basically, that there should be a minimum tax on that, which I wouldn't have thought would be feasible some time ago. I mean, also again, against the perspective of the crisis, how do you assess the ability of governments to act and actually manage this relationship and maybe not preclude innovation, but direct it in the right direction. Right. So I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, in Europe on the services directive. And the, there's something that's called posted workers directive. So for example, you know, there's a free mobility of workers and stuff. And if uh, a German firm hires a Polish construction company, they can bring their own workers to do the job, but only up to a certain limit. After mm -hmm. a certain amount of time, they have to obey the local German laws. And that, that is, so there's limits to it without, and I think those are the sorts of things we have to move towards. It's relatively easy in, uh, in the European in Union, especially when it's people are actually crossing the border, so you see them. But increasingly, you just see them on the screen. Hmm. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's harder to control in some ways. Personally, I, I don't think, I think there is going to be a big arbitrage on these wages, and a lot of people are essentially overpaid. It, for, for the compared to their productivity because they're in a non-traded sector and as they come into a traded sector, just like the factory workers in Europe found out, no, they were overpaid compared to their productivity mm. and there was some adjustment on price and some adjustment on quantity and that was essentially inevitable. The tariffs and a few things like that can slow it down, subsidy can slow it down, but ultimately the arbitrage does mean that you get paid what the productivity is. And many, many people in, in uh, rich countries are in jobs where their productivity does not um, justify their salary compared to what's going on. As you can see, with when immigrants come in and will perform the same job for less let's, or, or perform jobs that locals won't do, they're as productive and they get a different salary. So, I mean, anyways, my, my point is, is that I, I don't think there's any way to fix the fact that there's going to be this arbitrage and a wage adjustment um, between the service sector and the trade sector. You mentioned immigration, and that brings me to one of the questions we actually got from the audience. And please, uh, everyone out there, continue posting questions, um, which is the point about uh, labor markets and immigration. Um, I mean, part of the, if you wish, populist upheaval that we have seen over the years, over the past years, had also had not only to do with globalization, but also immigration, maybe as a phenomenon of globalization and the, the challenges that societies face with it. So now, if we can kind of migrate the work <laughs> instead of bringing the people in, wouldn't that be a smart move? Obviously those people need to be able to do the job, right? So uh, how can we get there? Uh, or mm. is it just kind of an illusion that we think that actually can help us solve problems from your perspective? No, I, th I think th there's a very clear substitution between people coming here and people doing the job remotely. Um, and, and that, I think, will reduce migration pressures. And w w uh, su subsequent um, work I did, I'm looking at the implications for the emerging markets. This book is all about the rich world. Uh, and I think this is an enormous export opportunity for them. So I think the emerging market miracle will spread and to keep going and, and spread geographically. So for example, Africa, Northern Africa, just take a, a Kenya is one of the classic countries people point to here, uh, that, that this will be a great opportunity for them to grow and therefore less pressure for them to come here. And uh, if you've got a vibrant, you know, 
it not, it's no longer commodity-based or manufacturing-based, it's service-based. So it looks a little bit more like the Indian development experience. And that would be a good thing, both for the world and justice, but also reducing pressure for people to get on boats and, and move or, or march across the land. So I think it's not probably going, you know, a lot of these things, the thing that happened, the, the migration spike that happened here in Europe, had nothing to do with globalization or wages, it was disruption. And I, you know, we can think about a lot more of that. But at, if it's always much better to provide work for people where they are rather than have people move for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not better, but anyways, it'll be less disruptive politically. No, sure. And um, I think, at least for what I can say, from European poli policies have obviously moved from making sure that, so to speak, you defend your borders and those people come in that you want to come in. But also it was clearly understood that's not enough. And, it, and I, we can probably also agree that this by itself will not hold up the migration pressure that we may otherwise seeing with climate change and for other reasons if you don't improve living conditions somewhere else. And then what you are saying essentially is that new technology, Digitech, offers another avenue of doing this, right? Yeah, yeah, is, absolutely, yeah. Um, so there is one point on the, um, that, that comes up here also in, uh, for, from the audience that relates to Europe, and you mentioned the single market. Now with the pandemic, we have brought up this huge program, the Next Generation EU uh, for, for Europe. And there are two key components. One is making the economies greener. The other component is digitalization. So we want to improve on digitalization. So, um, which again, can help to accelerate what, what you are, the, the, the picture you're painting. And we want to be more modern. We actually want not only trail the Chinese may be an artificial intelligence or the Americans, but actually you want to have a say in it and do it. Um, a good thing or is it, I mean, given that speed is an issue, yeah. if we do it, do we have to think a lot about a lot of other things at the same time? And, and you would be a call for policy, that would be actually be a call for policy action that we have overlooked so far. Yeah, no, I, I, well, so I'm a, I, I think probably this digit moved. First of all, it, well, this is the kind of thing you're accelerating a trend that's going to happen anyways. So it's not like uh, trying to create uh, a powdered medical, powdered metal industry that nobody knows how it's going to come out and you spend billions in might. This is just giving people better access, better tools. That will eventually happen. That's the course of history and you're just accelerating it. The other is I think in, in the idea of telemigration is these jobs don't necessarily have to go to the Ukraine they could go to south, southern Italy or they could go to re remote uh, Spain. So it could be good for territorial cohesion even in Europe. So I think it's a good thing. Hmm. But uh, all, ultimately, this great transformation of the society is we are moving to jobs, service sector jobs, where uh, it will be human and local. But digital will be part of that world because no matter where you are, you will be using these software robots and you will be using these telemigrants. They will become part of everyday life. And if you're not in that world, you won't enjoy the, the productivity benefits and the cost benefits that come from being able to source you know, your back office things or get certain uh, tasks or functions done in your service, but somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I do think it is a, a core competitiveness now. And, and it, I mean, it's almost a no-brainer because it's gonna, you're, you're just going with the course of history and pushing it forward a little bit. I would like to do a short derailment okay. uh, before we, we actually, um, so it's so in moving forward, also based on a question that comes up. I mean, you say a lot on the, um, we have talked about Digitech and what the medium term trends. I mean, if we now think about globalization at this stage, post pandemic, what is in people's mind is much more the old economy, right? <laughs> it's much more that energy prices are up. We are warned that you have to actually order your Christmas gifts early <laughs> because otherwise you may not get it because right. there are supply constraints. This is old economy stuff, I understand, yeah, I yeah. think, right? And still it's looks a bit, bit nearer than the picture we are painting and what we see in terms of trends. Uh, I mean, you have done a lot of international economics, right? So just maybe also, I mean, how 
first how you look at those kind of supply side con uh, constraints that we don't don't get the computer chips that we think we need or that we literally need for production, and how far will we go over that uh, in order to actually move on? Yeah, well, so let me just uh, talk, uh, I have a theme about what I call digital shear, which is digital, anything that's going digital is doubling every two years, everything that's not going digital is doubling every two decades. And one of the disruptions we see in the modern economy is certain elements in the same service are the old, and some are the new. Mm. And there's a shear between, that's really the, 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 a lot of the tension is coming because certain elements of, say, being a university professor or high school teacher are subject to the digital and others are not. And that kind of leads to a, a problem. And mm -hmm. what we're seeing now with the supply chain is that there, if there had not been digital stuff, if this, our services weren't digital, we would have had the mother of all disruption of services, but it's so flexible, and they uh, somehow or another they expanded the capacity of the w internet massively without problems. We would have had this problem. The huge demand did not lead in in the digital world. Now, in my mind, in the physical world, what it uh, and I'm not an expert on this, but reading experts, I believe that a lot of it has to do with the demand surge, unanticipated mm -hmm. demand surge. And uh, there was a very art good article by Daniel Jurgen, who's a sort of expert in these sorts of things. And he said, basically, everybody knew we were going to online sales. That was in everybody's business plan. But there was an acceleration of about five years in one year. So what people expected to happen over five years happened in one year. And that had two uh, big implications. One is it was an unanticipated surge. It, 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 the demand surged when we didn't really expect it to happen. And second of all, it went through um, tele, you know, uh, online buying. So the shipments all had to go to distribution centers instead of distributed out to stores. Mm -hmm. So that led to choke nets, cho choke points in the supply chain with containers and labor. And, and on top of that, during the lockdown, a lot of people left trucking and logistics because those were all shut down. Uh, not all of them, but many of them were sh shut down and downsized. And there was such uncertainty. When are we coming back? You know, I remember the first wave, well, it would be, it would be like the flu, you know, be bad, few bad months, and then we're back. Uh, hmm. And then there was another one. And then there was another one. And uh, people like you and me who used to, they go to big conferences that were organized a year in advance. People just stopped organizing anything a year in advance because you just never knew. And that hit those logistics of physical things, of ports, logistics, truck drivers, and, and that all put together led to choke points, and the containers is a big thing. And then on top of it, there's a few things in Vietnam and China where they would get hit with physical lockdowns. So I think it's a really a transitional thing, but all mm. driven primarily by unanticipated demand surges when people started shopping online. And so ultimately, it'll move itself on, it moves it off. But, it, but just to go back to my initial point, the choke point wasn't being able to order the stuff. You, all, not, you, know, you got through to the website, you put in your order, you just had to wait two months for it to come. Yeah. So it was a digital world worked okay. It was a physical world which, which had to adjust slowly. No, no, uh, yeah. On, on that one, we, we certainly can agree that without the digital services that were there and that were very rapidly created, um, actually, it, it may not have worked. Actually, also, if you think about the supply chains, that we probably without kind of a really also globally working network, we would not have been able to come up with vaccines as, as fast as we did. So it's actually not, I mean, if now people become critical on globalization, I think it's not globalization to blame in the first place. There was a lot of good stuff and a lot that worked with globalization. But now, as you said, we have the shortages. And, and that is also what we obviously read in the analysis. The containers are in the wrong place because they were not shipped and the kind of order structures were, were changed. Uh, also, I, I read that there's a lot of this efficiency that we had before with the just-in-time delivery, right? When then suddenly one part gets disrupted, you don't have a stock of things there. And then, yes, you need to wait a little longer because until this stock is kind of piled up again and, and things run smoothly. And that will be part of the policy that we will also have to have in the future, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I just finished a paper with uh, Rick, Rebecca Friedman on the risk of global supply chains. And, uh, 
uh, annual review of economics. And one of the, we read a lot, there, there's not much in the economics literature, but there's a lot in the international business and logistics and management literature. One of the big changes, though, is that they were used to dealing with idiosyncratic shocks. One country, one hurricane, one industry. And what we've seen is systemic shocks with COVID, for one thing, and climate change may be the same thing, we see much larger. And so what is a robust supply chain when there may be a tsunami in Japan or a flood in Thailand is completely different than if there's things going to be shut down all around the world or Singapore will be shut down for months, which is the, where everything goes through. So those are much more systemic uh, risks that, that people, businesses were not, were not used to. So that, but right. let me just come on your point about the, the globalization being the hero of the, of the COVID, as I would like to put it. I mean, the, if it had not been for the global supply chain and trade, lots of medical personnel in Europe and the United States would have had to treat COVID patients unprotected. Mm -hmm. that the, the fact that China and Vietnam and Malaysia could ramp up their production and send it over very, very quickly, that saved an enormous number of lives. And as you pointed out, there's no way we could have produced billions of doses of vaccines in such a short time if we didn't have the mass of specialization and concentration of scale economies in all the little ingredients that the modern pharmaceutical industry is, is now. So quite literally, millions of more people would have died if we didn't have this trading system. So I think when history is written, trade will be the hero of the COVID, not the, Vic, not the, mm. uh, the culprit. But I, I'm... I'm biased, but that, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 think I, I, I think you are. Maybe yeah. we economists are, because I mean, in, in the way we overlook yeah. also part of the, for a while, part of the problems that come with it and, and that you also point to in terms of the, this difficulty in getting job dislocation, job destruction and job creation right over time. And that's important. Maybe to conclude, there is one point that also comes up in, in the chat is this link, and you mentioned it now, with climate change, right? So what are the implications for climate change of this? In, in a way, you get more efficient, maybe moving data is more efficient also than moving people and more energy saving. What, how do you see the link? Uh, so I haven't given it a great deal of thought, but uh, I, I have re recently been asked that question a couple of times, so I have a little bit of thought. I would hardly call it uh, well thought out. So I think there's a couple of things that are, are worth pointing out. For, first of all, this telemigration isn't really a huge e-waste. People are telecommuting domestically. And if, if you telecommute from something a, another 100 or another 1,000 kilometers away, it doesn't change much. So mm. th this idea of e-waste and uh, all that, I, I, I think, is somewhat misplaced. We're going online. We will be online no matter what. If co parts of COVID will not go, go away. It's just whether they're close by or a little bit further away. So that, that's the first thing. So ultimately, I think the post-industrial society is a cleaner society. Mm. And this moving into sheltered jobs, more local jobs, uh, is uh, probably going to involve less travel, less waste. And as our share of consumption moves on to more services, buying from other services, I think ultimately that can be uh, greener and will be good. The other thing is uh, deep down, there will be no mitigation unless technology moves from a handful of countries where it is to the rest of the world. And that will be enormously facilitated by things like telemigration, providing mm. services, uh, and you know, other kinds of integration. And a lot the same things too with adaptation. So a lot of the adaptation will require efficient cooling solutions, efficient water solutions in food, and uh, protection against waves. And a lot of that is technology embedded in goods, services, or intellectual property rights that has to move. And although that's not quite this third unbundling, it, that probably will facilitate it and, uh, and also give people who have to buy these technologies an opportunity to earn export dollars to, to pay for them, in essence. So that's not a very joined up answer. But, you know, I, I think ultimately digital technology will be part of everything we do, including climate change. But I also don't think it's a silver bullet that, uh, you know, but again, here it can be helpful. I just think what I what I hear from the World Health Organization that say also we need big data, data centers to analyze it and actually share that information globally to have kind of a good warning system that helps in the end all of us. That I think is the point. 
Richard, it has been a super interesting conversation. Thanks a lot for being available for this lunch talk. I hope everyone who was out there enjoyed it as well. I did tremendously. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thank you very much, Ralph. That was great. It's weird. But there we go. Cheers.